Living systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no landfill. Instead, materials flow. One species' waste is another's food, energy is provided by the sun, things grow, then die, and nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machine packs up, so we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often producing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy? Let's start with the biological cycle. How can our waste build capital rather than reduce it? By rethinking and redesigning products and components and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of rethink, a way to cycle valuable metals, polymers and alloys so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throw away and replace culture we've become used to, we'd adopt a return and renew one where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers their technical materials being reused and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is, there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. But the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. We have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, we really can rethink and redesign our future. All right, great. Thank you all for coming back for this afternoon session where we are gonna have the Circular Economy Initiative pitches. And so one of the things I wanted to say is that one of our speakers is also speaking in Spanish again this afternoon. So for those of you who need to have the audio set, please step out to the information area and get the translation um, headset. Uh, in the meantime, we will go ahead and start with our pitches today. And uh, the f I will allow each of you to introduce yourself and what you're doing rather than me because I didn't get a lot of notes. So uh, within this, I'll invite Adrian as to be the first speaker to come up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, just wondering where the slides are for a moment. And if by magic. All right, well, um, at Recycling Technologies, uh, we turn uh, end-of-life plastic back into oil. Um, we all know that plastic comes from oil, and so uh, by sending it back into that oil, uh, it becomes something that people can use again to make more plastic, um, thus 
completing the loop. And so the world of plastic is a, is a fascinating one. Plastic is a fantastic material. Um, it keep, clearly keeps our food fresher for longer. Um, it, it makes our cars, our planes lighter and more fuel efficient. And so the, the environmental narrative of plastic is, is an exceptionally good one, but it's pretty shocking when you actually find out uh, what happens to it at the end of its life. And uh, I'm very indebted to the uh, new plastics economy, of which we were a part now, um, for their analysis of what does happen to plastic at the end of its life. And, you know, shockingly, 40% of it ends up in landfill. 14% of it ends up in energy from waste. But what's even more alarming is the 32%, which ends up in the ecosystem. And that ends up with pictures that look like this. Um, and I have to say, I was very shocked when I heard the figures in January this year that by 2025, there'll be one ton of plastic in the world's oceans for every three ton of fish. By 2050, more plastic in the ocean than fish. And frankly, I don't want to live in a world like that. Um, I'm sure you don't either. And uh, so I'm very pleased to say we can really do something about this problem. Now, um, people call uh, the waste industry uh, units, if you like, lots of different things. And so to try and avoid uh, um, a confusion, in the UK, we would call this a MRF, a material reclamation facility. But either by curbside collection or actually in a factory uh, type of situation, people extract from our waste stream the things that actually have residual value, the wood, the cardboard, the paper, and so on and so forth. But then you get to the red line um, where it actually things cease to be a resource and they become a liability. And for most of the MRF operators or material reclamation facility operators, the only choices they have is either landfill it or send it to energy from waste. What our view is, is that that can actually be very different. I'll let other people talk about biogenic material, but there's a lot of excellent work going on in that. And, and people are actually turning that material into things which have value longer term. But it's the plastic bit that's in that stream that we want to talk about because we've invented a machine which can actually sit in a MRF or a material reclamation facility and actually process the plastic back into oil actually on the site. That machine looks a bit like this. And so each of these gray uh, frames represents a 20 foot shipping container. And so these are mass producible so that the manufacturing cost of these can actually be as low as possible. Uh, we are then leasing these machines to MRFs so that they, w w they can use them to actually convert the plastic into plaques. Each machine will do about 7,000 tons a year or about a, a ton an hour. And that plaques then is a, a very transportable material which can go back to the petrochems industries, the Dow's, the BASF's, the Borealis's of this world. And so um, by actually leasing the machines, clearly our intention there is that at the end of their life, which is typically 20, 25 years, um, we would bring these back to the factory and, and rework them. And so uh, where are we at at the moment? Um, currently, there's not so that lots of these actually already in operation. We're a startup company. We just built this, uh, this pilot plant, which I'm happy to say is now working well. Um, and, and, and this is actually a near commercial scale pilot plant, so we can show that this process is there. But how does that work in the, in the uh, circular economy? Well, we all understand plastic. It's coming from oil and gas, goes to the polymer manufacturers, and ends up with the end consumer. And so in the circular economy, yes, we'd love to see lots of reuse. And, and plastic bags and things at shopping uh, malls is actually a good example where we reuse things now where once we actually just threw them away. But then when we talk about mechanical recycling, and, and let's remember that Ellen the, uh, uh, yesterday, she said that 2% of plastic is recycled, and that's quite right. There's 8%, which is what they would say down cycles, um, and, and, and hence uh, that represents what I've put in my diagram here as mechanical recycling. But what we are trying to do is actually a slightly bigger loop, an outer loop, if you like, um, which is feedstock recycling. So typically, 90% either ends up in energy from waste, landfill, or as I say, leaked from the system, the 32%. And then 10% is mechanically recycled. Well, the world that, is, uh, that we envisage um, looks a lot more like this on the right-hand side. So uh, 
mechanical recycling can be done much, much better than it currently is. 10% now, um, clearly that can actually grow much, much further. But it's this outer loop, the 50% that could go to feedstock recycling. It's, it's the balance. It's the, it's the stuff which the mechanical recycling can't deal with. The things like laminate plastics, which we all know and, and use, but are not recyclable at this point in time. And so they can be turned back into polymers, and so therefore uh, are available back into the economy in true circular economy style. And so if you want to actually come with us on this sort of transition, uh, we're looking for waste operators who want to get involved with putting one of these machines on their sites. We're also looking for funders. So if there's anybody out there in one of those categories, do come and catch me afterwards. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the session. My name is uh, Jordi Olive. I'm executive director of Inedit, which is a innovation agency, a consultancy uh, for mainly industry and public administration on eco design and eco innovation. We were founded seven years ago uh, at the research park of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And uh, today, with the limited time that we have, uh, I will skip the introduction. Uh, we have had during the la these last three days, uh, a lot of outstanding speakers that have already introduced what the um, circular economy is, uh, which are the drivers for companies, for institutions, for moving towards uh, circularity, which are the barriers that they encounter, which are the benefits that they achieve when they have a circular business model or, or better products. We have also seen uh, during these days in the conference uh, that there are different uh, scales of implementation. We have seen examples of European policies. We have seen examples of cities and regions having their own plans. We have seen the example of Paris, of London. We have seen also uh, in the poster session uh, circular, circular economy in the Netherlands, who is applying the city scan in cities such as Amsterdam, Den Haag, uh, Brussels, Glasgow are already having their own plans for moving towards circularity, identifying the priority flows, the priority sectors where to take action. But cities and regions uh, have, and uh, in their territories, operate large corporations, SMEs, and also financial institutions. Large corporations are more and more interested and more and more working very seriously on making their value chains fu change fully sustainable. This involved the work with SMEs. SMEs are 99% of European companies, and most of them are suppliers of larger companies as well. Therefore, the partnership between large corporations and SMEs is crucial for moving, moving towards uh, circular business models and a circular society. But of course, the financial institutions, we also saw yesterday that banks are not just lenders, but they have a key role for accelerating the process, the transition towards circularity. We, in Inedit, focus mainly on the work with uh, the private sector. And within this, of course, by mass, uh, it's uh, SMEs. 99% of uh, companies are SMEs. SMEs are part of the value chain of larger corporations. They are flexible enough for coping, for dealing with the requirements, the new requirements of these large corporations. But they have some flaws, some limitations. Uh, some of them related to the budgetary issues or time, availability, and the skills that, uh, that are not available in their own staff. So we try to fill this gap to provide methods that are adapted to SMEs, which are not time consuming nor, nor expensive, and supplying highly skilled staff for uh, approaching to their needs. For building, we really believe that SMEs have to, buy, to build their own path towards circularity adapted to, to their needs. Many times we find methods that are thought for the 1%, for the larger corporations, for large institutions that do not fit with the needs and the realities of SMEs. That's why we have developed 
during the last seven years and approach a method uh, that does not eliminate the need for um, tools such as life cycle assessment, carbon footprinting, water footprint. This is a basis for taking decision. This is important, but it's not compulsory for starting the path towards eco-design of products, for instance. No? So we define a circular vision. We meet with the companies, we sit down, we join together in the same table, the managers, the technical staff, marketing, purchase, etc. All, to, all together talking about their product from a circular vision. We think, we create together the vision of how this product would look like if it was fully sustainable, fully circular. From that, we do a backcasting and we identify the gaps, the difference between the vision and the reality. And we start another creative process by developing eco-design strategies that would approach the reality, the current reality, to the desired vision. And finally, we finish with a roadmap towards the eco-design. As I said, the first step is creative, is envisioning what's going on in the market, which are the competitors doing, which are the trends that I'm seeing, the macro trends. Then we identify the challenges. What has to be changed in my product? It's the materials, it's the production processes, it's the packaging. Where are the flows? And then we identify, we create solutions, and finally, we leave the company with a roadmap, with the next steps clearly identified, which actions have to be taken in the following month, who has to take care of it, well, how, how much is it, and how long will it take to implement. What our vision is to have an ecosystem of companies that is smart, smart in the sense of clever decisions, of good design, that is successful, successful in the market, that is profitable, that is good for the environment and good for society, and therefore sustainable. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Marta Ruiz y vengo en nombre de Graphestock. Se escucha bien. Es una compañía que ha creado revestimientos para las nuevas generaciones y son revestimientos muy nuevos que solo podían ser pensables eh, a partir del día de hoy, ya que la industria de los revestimientos se había centrado en el plástico y en los cementos desde la Segunda Guerra Mundial para reconstruir un mundo que había quedado completamente destruido por la guerra y buscaban un tipo de materiales que les dieran una solución rápida, pero que se ha visto que no eran los mejores desde el punto de vista ni de la sostenibilidad ni de la salud. Eh, vengo a presentaros el modelo de economía circular que estamos implementando para conseguirlo. El contexto que, que tenemos a día de hoy, como sabemos, es de, de un calentamiento global y no es nada nuevo la, la contribución de la industria de la construcción a este calentamiento. Sobre todo, uh, por ejemplo, podemos tener en cuenta que cada, que cada americano gasta unos 11 litros en promedio por persona y año de pintura. Pintura nada más. Que tiene unas emisiones de compuestos orgánicos volátiles, cancerígenos y contaminantes. Solamente podemos pensar en, en esta en esta industria como algo muy, muy contribuyente al calentamiento global. Grafestone viene a traernos una solución, es el único revestimiento que además de absorber CO2, emite 0% de compuestos orgánicos volátiles al medio ambiente y purifica el ambiente. Solamente con pensar que cada americano medio consume 11 litros de pintura, podemos ver la contribución que podemos realizar al medio ambiente solamente con una parte de la industria de la construcción como son los revestimientos. En la compañía hemos implementado un roadmap para conseguir eh, alcanzar nuestros objetivos de certificación Cradle to Cradle, que supongo estarán familiarizados con, el, con la certificación Cradle to Cradle. Se ha, se ha llevado a cabo una, un proceso que inició en 2016 y con vistas a, hasta 2021 con una serie de secuencias 
hemos sido un caso rapidísimo de implementación de este sistema de Cradle to Cradle con la ayuda de la consultora Eco Intelligent Growth, que están por aquí. Y hemos conseguido en tan solo seis meses certificar con, con la certificación más alta que posee una pintura hoy día en el mundo, la certificación de Gold, cuatro de, nos, de nuestros productos que mejor se venden. Las pinturas blancas de interior y exterior y las imprimaciones también de interior y exterior. Solo seis meses más tarde se ha conseguido certificar un sistema de pinturas de más de 10.000 colores y hay acciones implementadas previstas hasta 2021. Podemos ver las categorías que hemos adquirido en cada uno de los apartados que valora la certificación Cradle to Cradle con cada uno de estos productos. Como vemos, se ha alcanzado un alto grado de excelencia en la administración del agua, en el caso de, lo, de las pinturas de interior y de exterior y, lo, y las imprimaciones también, si bien hay bastante margen de mejora para el apartado de los envases. La idea es que podamos incardinar la calidad total integral de Grafeston y los productos asociados dentro del marco del diseño del Cradle to Cradle. Dentro de este roadmap que nos hemos marcado, los principios que en los que nos vamos a basar son los del Triple Top Line y los del Cradle to Cradle, que por un lado buscan maximizar el beneficio económico, la protección ambiental y la justicia social, Mientras se trata de convertir todos los residuos en nutrientes, se trata de utilizar energías renovables y fomentar la diversidad de las especies. Siempre vamos a intentar seleccionar materias primas que sean seguras y saludables, eliminar el concepto de residuo, operar con energías limpias y abundantes, salvaguardando el agua, que es un recurso precioso, como sabemos, respetando los sistemas naturales y humanos, y desarrollar tantos productos y soluciones sostenibles en, en base al Cradle to Cradle como sea posible. Tenemos ahí un resumen de todas las acciones que hay por implementar hasta 2021, son muchísimas. Nos centraremos en, en la reutilización del material, donde se ha, se ha centrado la filosofía en conseguir que en la eliminación del concepto de, de residuo, que nosotros consigamos diseñar para eliminar el concepto de residuo para lo que se ha creado un ciclo de nutrientes en los que se busca maximizar en todo momento el valor del nutriente y conseguir aspirando a un 100% de superreciclado y de recuperación de los nutrientes. Por otra parte, tenemos que pensar que nuestros productos, todos los de Grafeston, están hechos en base de cal, que es un residuo, o sea, que es un nutriente técnico que se puede reciclar tanto en su aplicación en superficies minerales y de piedra y como, como el, el, en, en sí el componente que queda tras la carbonatación es carbonato de calcio, que es un nutriente muy habitual, muy habitual en la naturaleza, completamente inocuo. Eh, así nuestros productos son en un 95% compatibles con el medio ambiente, con lo cual el apartado de reutilización del material es algo que viene de forma natural. La compañía nuestra es muy joven, la evolución que tenemos es desde 2010 solamente donde se crea. En, en 2015 estuvimos aquí en la Costrumat de Barcelona donde nos dieron el premio al material más innovador en la categoría de innovación, sostenibilidad y justicia social. Y solo en 2016 empezamos a trabajar con el programa de Cradle to Cradle, como decía de la mano de la consultora Eco Intelligent Growth, en 2016, y como, como explicaba, conseguimos rápidamente en seis meses certificar cuatro de nuestros principales productos con la certificación Gold. Y ya en abril del 2016 nos incorporamos en la plataforma de Google Pórtico de Materiales, donde vimos que teníamos 14 de 20 puntos posibles, eh, los incorporábamos ya. Somos partner de la consultora Delta, que está en la zona de Países Bajos, donde nos hemos incorporado al proyecto Park 2020 para, para introducir nuestros materiales. En, en, la, en el comité de, de práctica del Cradle to Cradle de Estados Unidos de este año se mencionó el proyecto de Grafeston y la rapidez con la que había conseguido todas las certificaciones. Y, y en otros seis meses, como he mencionado, conseguimos certificar más de 10.000 colores, esta vez con la calificación Silver, pero pero ha sido un, un proceso muy rápido con el horizonte de 2021 donde, 
donde aspiramos a la excelencia absoluta. La propuesta de valor de Grafestone está, está bastante clara, pero más allá de hablar de, de un revestimiento o, o de una pintura, estamos hablando de algo muchísimo más importante, de un intangible como es la salud. Salud que hasta el momento ha, estado, ha venido estando dañada por industrias como la del plástico en el tema de las pinturas plásticas y la del cemento. ¿Qué valor le podemos otorgar a la salud dentro de la construcción? Y con esto quería cerrar. Buenas tardes a todos. All right. I didn't get the pad, but I wonder if there are questions that we wanted to Ah. Okay, I'm back on. Yeah, so I didn't uh, here it is. <laughs> okay, so let's see if you all entered in questions. Then we also have the microphone set up on the side, too. Uh, so thank you all for presenting. Uh, let's just see if we have some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. All right, it does not look like we have any questions in here, but if anyone would like to ask at the mic, we have one set up on each side. Thank you. Hi, you hear me? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is for Adrian, and the other one is for Jordi. Uh, Adrian, have you uh, measured the efficiency of your systems in terms of oil, total equivalent oil versus the oil produced? And the question for Jordi is if you've, if you've uh, detected any trend working with SMEs, any trend, whether is it packaging, eco-designing, or any general trend that it's usually the right path uh, or the low-hanging fruit uh, in, your, in your processes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, um, uh, uh, energy efficiency of the system is about 85%. Um, that gives you about a 75% yield on the actual materials because the, the end product actually has a slightly higher energy value per kilo than the, uh, than the input. So it's actually a pretty uh, um, energy um, efficient process. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, indeed, um, one common trend uh, among uh, SMEs, at least in, in the Spanish market, which I, which the one I know the most, um, is that the action is taken uh, on demand. So there are some, of course, some uh, pro proactive SMEs in this field. There are, of course. But most of them that take action is because they have a request, a demand from a larger corporation mainly that uh, represents a big share of their sales that says, look, I have to position better in that market, so I need you to perform better in this, 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 and these issues. This is a strong, very strong motivation. And, and concerning the areas of uh, action, normally uh, eco-design of packaging is kind of a good entry point uh, for SMEs because you don't um, touch their product. You are touching something that is extra, it's added. So you don't modify their baby, uh, what they love, uh, but it's the packaging. So they start understanding what is eco-design, how is thinking on a life cycle, and normally it's easier uh, to start from an uh, eco-design of packaging. And in addition, uh, they can also obtain uh, large uh, benefits from that. So the room for improvement can be important. Is that coming up? Great. That, I think that mic's on, too. Yeah. Um, our experience in... Uh, <coughs> working with SMEs, and we are an SME, <laughs> um, is the, the cost to the SME for the goal setting process that you just uh, described. So how do you set uh, your fees and do you sometimes take a piece of the action uh, in order to compensate for their startup costs for you? Okay, um, yeah, well the, the fees. <laughs> uh, we are consultancy, so we, we use 
uh, and, and the eco design has a for us is a, a problem that uh, we can uh, provide environmental and economic benefits for uh, our clients because at the end uh, of the process what we are doing is optimize uh, the use of materials of energy logistics etc so uh, environment and economy go together in this process but we don't know in advance uh, the result that we will achieve we, we don't know uh, in other sectors as uh, energy service uh, companies uh, can have uh, an estimation of the saving that they will, the, the service will represent to the to the to the client, to the client, and it's not our case. Um, so basically, our fee is per, per the time the, the, the time that we have to uh, to use in each in each project. Not the, the it's very difficult. It would, we would like to charge by the value that we bring to the company, but uh, since now we haven't been successful in doing so. So do you have a sort of a, a standard uh, fee schedule, or do you do it on a customized basis with each uh, company? Standard. It's a standard, a standard fee. Yeah. And do you normally find that in order to set these initial goals that you're talking about, is it uh, half a day, a day, a week? I mean, how, how much time do you find that it, it takes to do this? OK. Um, there are different methodologies and, and tools. What we found was that if we had to start every project, every eco-design project with a life cycle assessment, with a detailed assessment, this was a barrier for many SMEs to spend, I don't know, 10,000 euros just for having a first picture of where they were. Uh, and, and we didn't want to be a barrier for, for eco-design, for or eco circular economy. So uh, we had to adapt our methodologies to, be, to a more qualitative ones, so that in three meetings, and by using the knowledge that is already in the company, we could develop uh, an action plan. So basically, that it, this involves uh, three meetings of one morning uh, with the company, and of course, some homework, both for the company and for us. Thank you. Welcome. Over here, yeah. Uh, should I ask it in Spanish and it's translated, or should I ask in English and they translate? Lo hago en español directamente, es para ti, Marta. Sí. Sí. Ah, so everybody understands. Okay. Right. So. Um, I was just, first of all, congratulations for this product. Um, Thank you. I had no idea about the toxicity of uh, paints, so it's wonderful. <clears throat> I was just wondering um, whether the market is accepting this product and if construction brands are understanding how important it is for the health of um, the future users of the housings. Mm -hmm. And if you can compete when it comes to costs with plastic paints, if it's easy for you to enter the market um, yeah, when it, when it comes to numbers. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. These, these paints are being broadly accepted in the world. Paints and mortars, too. And we are newcomers, and we, we have really got no competitors because we are the first uh, company to manufacture coatings with lime and graphene. So um, the industry as a whole, like all, all the trade fairs that we visit, everybody wants to listen. And we are spreading around the world. We've got a factory in Panama and another one in China. And being such a young company, we are quite spread. Uh, when it comes to costs, we are very competitive because we can, uh, well, graphene optimizes the way we we apply, and we need only apply thin coats. So we spend less uh, material, we need less maintenance, and we and it's easy to apply. And yet you mm, you've got to come by the by the kilo, the paints are more expensive. So you've got to discuss with the customer to make them think in the medium term, which is sometimes not that easy. That's our fight. 
but we are really competitive in prices with plastic paints that are harmful for the health and do not absorb CO2. So we, if you compare in the midterm with the costs and the benefits, you would have no doubt. <laughs> this is how it's going in the world. So far, we are very young. We are still fighting. Thank you for the question. Does anybody else have, have questions for our pitch panelists? No? All right, great. Uh, this one's for Adrian, uh, again. Um, we usually told that the, the, the narrower the loop, uh, the more value you retain, the less energy you use to. Um, I'd like to, to know what's your view now that you have this system, if, if that's completely true and uh, your system breaks that uh, paradigm uh, in any way. And uh, I would also like to know what's the selection process, if any, uh, you do at the, or the, the places where your, your system is installed. If you do any, any, you have any criteria for selecting the plastics you're, you're gonna use, feed your system into, or, or, or the plastics that are gonna be reused or, or uh, transform into polymer directly. Okay, great questions. Um, so uh, clearly, if people could actually uh, process plastic on an inner loop, then that's better. You know, absolutely no bones about that. Um, if we can reuse it, then, then that's obviously retaining more value. Um, if you can mechanically recycle it, then, then great. And so what we're actually um, trying to provide is a service that says, if you can't reuse it and you can't mechanically recycle it, then for goodness sake, don't just throw it away or just burn it. You know, this is great material. And so it's providing the, the final alternative. And so, you know, the, uh, you know, plastic is, a, is as I said, a, a fantastic material, um, but some of the pro qualities that it has and which makes it great actually also makes it hard to actually deal with. And so if you think about things like laminate packaging, um, which a lot of food is actually held in or a lot of uh, stuff which actually has um, extended um, shelf life um, is, is retained in, plastic lamin uh, or laminate um, packaging is just not recyclable mechanically. And so in those scenarios, you know, when mechanical recycling isn't an option, then we would say it's better to use an outer loop than it is to actually lose it out of the system altogether. Okay. Um, and then in terms of which plastics, um, you know, w we are agnostic really to the, the type of plastic that we use. We recognize that in a, a material um, recovery facility, uh, people are going to take out, you know, starting with the HDPE and then they'll take out the PET. Uh, they'll often take out PS and PP and things like that. Um, those are the materials that everybody has the ability to mechanically recycle. And we would encourage all of that. Um, we just take whatever's left on the belt, essentially. Um, so it's the negative sort. And so that includes, as I say, the laminates, but it includes rigids, you know, children's toys, patio tables, inside of cars, um, you know, all sorts of uh, plastics which people find difficult to deal with. We're agnostic to that. We'll just take it and process it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, then I think uh, we'll have maybe have some questions uh, for those of you if you're sticking around. Excellent. Excellent. Great. All right. Um, so we'll have a break before the workshops that start in uh, 30 minutes. And hopefully our, our pitch uh, panelists will, will stick around to answer some questions if you, if you think of some. Uh, but what I would say is to meet back in here in half an hour for those of you who are joining the two uh, workshops, one being um, Circular Lab and the other one being Innovate with a Circular Economy workshop. All right. Thank you. <laughs>